queer hiding place by mrs mary louisa molesworth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by chad horner located in ballyclare county antrim northern ireland don't forget to give teresa the pound from mamma said mabel as she kissed her cousin eleanor one afternoon when saying good-bye I must be quick. It's getting quite dark, and I was to be home early. Come along, Fred. You're sure you've got the pound, are you, Nellie? Asked Fred mischievously. Mamma told Mabel about it ever so many times. She's so famous at remembering things herself. I like hearing her tell you not to forget. Eleanor put her hand into her pocket. I think I've got it, she said. I remember it was wrapped in a piece of blue paper, wasn't it? You gave it to me just before we sat down to play our duet, and I was to say it was for aunt's subscription. Two, two, oh dear, I've forgotten. And she stood there in the hall, where she had come down to see the last of her visitors looking the picture of perplexity. Oh, you silly girl, said Mabel impatiently. It is Mamma's subscription to Teresa's Christmas dinner's card. There now, don't you remember? You are so dreadfully absent, Eleanor. I remember now, oh yes, of course, I won't forget again, said the girl, little girl, one could scarcely call her. For though she was only thirteen, she was as tall as her elder sister of eighteen. Good night again, Mabel. I must be quick, for I have to write to Charlie before dinner. You know I dine late, just now during the holidays, she said proudly. But the pound, the pound itself, have you got it? repeated Fred. Again went Eleanor's hand to her pocket. Oh dear, I forgot I was feeling for the pound, she exclaimed. Yes, here it is. I'll give it to Teresa, quite rightly. You'll see. Eleanor hurried away to write her letter to Charlie, for tomorrow would be Indian Mail Day, and she had put it off too late the week before. Now I must give the pound to Teresa at once, she said, again depositing it in her pocket when she changed her dress for dinner. Something or other put it out of her head in the drawing room. Poor Eleanor's head was not a very secure place to keep anything in for long. It was not till she and her mother and Teresa and her seventeen years old brother Mark were at table and halfway through dinner that the unlucky coin again returned into her memory. No thanks to her memory that it did so. It was only when she pulled out her handkerchief that the little paper packet came out with it and fell onto the floor. Oh, said Eleanor, as she stopped to pick it up, what a good thing I've remembered it. Here, Teresa, here's a pound for you from Auntie. For your, for the, oh, what, what, what is it? Your subscription for Christmas cards. No, I mean your subscription card for Christmas dinners. Yes, that's what it's for. All right, said Teresa quietly. I understand, but I wish you had given it me. Upstairs, Nellie, I haven't got a pocket in this thin skirt. Never mind, and she unwrapped it as she spoke and placed it on the table beside her. There now, she said, I can't forget it. It is too conspicuous on the white cloth. The sisters were sitting next each other. That is to say, Teresa was at one end with Mark opposite, and their mother and Eleanor were at the sides. The table was small, though large enough for a party of four. Not long was the gold coin allowed to rest peacefully, where Teresa had placed it. Eleanor's fingers soon picked it up. First, she examined it curiously by the light of the candle beside her. Then, when she had satisfied herself as to its date and some other particulars, she took to spinning it on the table. This was not very successful. To spin a coin well requires a hard surface for it to twirl on. Eleanor tried once or twice, then ended by spinning the sovereign onto the floor. Down she ducked, to pick it up again, thereby attracting her mother's notice. Nellie, my dear, what are you stooping down so awkwardly for, she said. Oh, said Teresa, it is all that pound. Do leave it alone, child, or it will be getting lost altogether. And she took it out of her sister's hand and put it under her wine glass. There, she said, don't touch it again. And for a course or two, the pound was safe. But Teresa forgot that wine glasses are not a fixture. After a while, the table was cleared of them, and the crumbs brushed away for dessert. The shining sovereign was again exposed to full view. Mother Teresa and Mark were talking busily about something interesting. 
Eleanor's ears were half listening, but her restless fingers were unoccupied. They seized on the coin again, and a new series of experiments with it was the result, even though she herself was but vaguely conscious what she was about. At last, just as she found a new trick, which ambushed the babyish side of her brain greatly, came a remark which thoroughly caught her attention. The day after tomorrow, Nellie, don't forget, said Teresa, I'm going to have the Leonards at afternoon tea. And the talk ran upon the Leonards, till they rose to go upstairs to the drawing room. Then came the exclamation from Teresa, My pound, Nellie, have you touched it? I put it under my wine glass, but of course I forgot. The wine glasses were changed. Henry to the footman, didn't you see it when you moved the glasses? It was there. Henry grew red and stared. Yes, ma'am, it was there. I saw it. I left it on the cloth. Eleanor stared too, though she did not grow red. Yes, she said, it was there. I took it up again, but I'm sure I did nothing with it. Nevertheless, a diving process into our pocket ensued in vain. Then she got up and shook herself. Then everybody began creeping and crawling about on the floor in vain. Then Mark got down a candle under the table thereby, as it was in a high silver candlestick nearly setting everything on fire. Then, then, I need not describe the well-known and most disagreeable experience of hunting for a lost object, which, of course, ere it comes to light, we seek in every corner but the right. On the whole, per Henry had the worst of it. He was told to examine my tray, and to overhaul my pantry from top to bottom, which he did with no result. I think he would gladly have gone down the drain pipe leading from my sink if he could have got into it. It is an uncomfortable affair, said Nellie's mother gravely. You see, the young man has so newly come. But, mother, I am sure I saw it after the dessert was on the table and the servants out of the room, said Eleanor eagerly. Then, my dear, where is it? You can fancy what an unsettled, spoiled evening it was. The ladies went upstairs at last, but Mark would not give in. He stayed in the dining room by himself, searching like a detective. Suddenly there came a shout of triumph. I have found it, he called upstairs. It is all right, Nellie. So it was, and where do you think it was? I will help you to guess by telling you one circumstance. There had been nuts at dessert. Well, what of that? The salt cellars had been left on the table and buried in one of them, shining yellow and bright, in the white powder lay the coin. Was it not clever of Mark to have thought of it? Oh, yes, said Eleanor, looking uncommonly ashamed of herself. I remember I pressed it down onto the salt, and then I covered it up. It looks so comfortable. Oh, I am so sorry. See what comes of letting your fingers get into the way of tricks, and letting your wits go wool-gathering. But poor Henry's character was saved. End of A Queer Hiding Place by Mrs. Mary Louisa Molesworth How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit CompleteAudiobooks.com for more quality content. The Dishonest Friend Retold by W. H. D. Rouse This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There was once a man who went on a journey and he asked a friend to take charge of his plough till he should return. The friend promised to take great care of it. But no sooner was the man gone than he sold the plough and put the price in his own pocket. Was not that a mean trick to serve a friend? The man came back and asked his friend for the plough. Oh, I am so sorry, the friend replied. My house is infested with rats, and one night a very big rat came and ate it up. Ah, well, said the man, what can't be cured must be endured. It must have been a very big rat, though. It was, said the other, very big. You must not suppose this man was quite such a fool as he seemed. 
You will soon see why he did not make a fuss about his plow. Next day, he took his friend's son out for a walk. When they had gone some distance, he took the boy to another friend's house and told this friend to keep the boy safe, but not to let him go out of the house till he returned. Then he ran back to the boy's father. Where is my boy? asked the father. Your boy? Oh, I remember. A hawk swooped down and carried him off. Oh, you liar! Oh, you murderer! said the friend. Come before the judge and then we shall see. As you please, said the man. So they went to the court. What is your complaint? asked the judge. My lord, this man took my son out for a walk with him and came back alone. And now, he says, a hawk carried him off. He must have murdered the boy. Justice, my lord, justice. What is this? asked the judge sternly. Come, my man, tell the truth. It is the truth, my lord, said the man. He came with me for a walk and was carried away by a hawk. Nonsense, said the judge. Whoever heard of a hawk carrying off a boy? And whoever heard, my lord, of a rat eating a plow? What do you mean? asked the judge. The man told his story. Then the judge saw that the man who complained had cheated his friend and understood what was the reason of this little trick. So he said to the man whose son was lost, If you find the plough that was entrusted to you, perhaps your son may be found too. The man was much annoyed at being found out, but willy-nilly he had to give the plough back. Then his son was brought back safe to him again, and he began to see that honesty is the best policy. End of The Dishonest Friend Retold by W. H. D. Rouse Read by Shruti Sinha The Giant Crab Retold by W. H. D. Rouse This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time there was a lake in the mountains, and in that lake lived a huge crab. I dare say you have often seen crabs boiled and put on a dish for you to eat, and perhaps at the seaside you have watched them sidling away at the bottom of a pool. Sometimes a boy or girl bathing in the sea gets a nip from a crab, and then there is squeaking and squealing. But our crab was much larger than these. He was the largest crab ever heard of. He was bigger than a dining room table, and his claws were as big as an armchair. Fancy what it must be to have a nip from such claws as those. Well, this huge crab lived all alone in the lake. Now the different animals that lived in the wild mountains used to come to that lake to drink. Deer and antelopes, foxes and wolves, lions and tigers and elephants. And whenever they came into the water to drink, the great crab was on the watch, and one of them at least never went up out of the water again. The crab used to nip it with one of his huge claws and pull it under, and then the poor beast was drowned and made a fine dinner for the big crab. This went on for a long time, and the crab grew bigger and bigger every day, fattening on the animals that came there to drink. So at last all the animals were afraid to go near that lake. This was a pity, because there was very little water in the mountains, and the creatures did not know what to do when they were thirsty. At last a great elephant made up his mind to put an end to the crab and his doings. So he and his wife agreed that they would lead a herd of elephants there to drink, and while the other elephants were drinking, they would look out for the crab. They did as they arranged. When the herd of elephants got to the lake, these two went in first and kept farthest out in the water, watching for the crab, and the others drank and trumpeted and washed themselves close inshore. Soon they had had enough and began to go out of the water, and then, sure enough, the elephant felt a tremendous nip on the leg. The crab had crawled up under the water and got him fast. He nodded to his wife, who bravely stayed by his side, and then she began. Dear Mr. Crab, she said, 
Please let my husband go. The crab poked his eyes out of the water. You know a crab's eyes grow on a kind of little stalk. And this crab was so big that his eyes looked like two thick tree trunks with a cannonball on the top of each. Now this crab was a great flirt. Or rather, he used to be a great flirt. But lately he had nobody to flirt with because he had eaten up all the creatures that came near him. And Mrs. Elephant was a beautiful elephant, with a shiny brown skin, and elegant flapping ears, and a curly trunk, and two white tusks that twinkled when she smiled. So when the big crab saw this beautiful elephant, he thought he would like to have a kiss, and he said in a wheedling tone, Dear little elephant, will you give me a kiss? Then Mrs. Elephant pretended to be very pleased and put her head on one side and flapped her tail. And she looked so sweet and so tempting that the crab let go the other elephant and began to crawl slowly towards her, waving his eyes about as he went. All this while Mr. Elephant had been in great pain from the nip of the crab's claw, but he had said nothing, for he was a very brave elephant. But he did not mean to let his wife come to any harm, not he. It was all part of their trick, and as soon as he felt his leg free, he trumpeted loud and long and jumped right upon the crab's back. Crack, crack, went the crab's shell, for, big as he was, an elephant was too heavy for him to carry. Crack, 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 the elephant jumped up and down on his back and in a very short time the crab was crushed to mincemeat. What rejoicing there was among the animals when they saw the crab crushed to death! From far and near they came, and passed a vote of thanks to the elephant and his wife, and made them king and queen of all the animals in the mountains. As for the crab, there was nothing left of him but his claws, which were so hard that nothing could even crack them. So they were left in the pool. And in the autumn there came a great flood, and carried the claws down into the river, and the river carried them hundreds of miles away to a great city, where the king's sons found them, and made out of them two immense drums, which they always beat when they go to war. And the very sound of these drums is enough to frighten the enemy away. End of the Giant Crab Retold by W. H. D. Robs Read by Shruti Sinha The Tale of Pickling Plant by Beatrix Potter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Max The Tale of Pickling Plant once upon a time there was an old pig called Aunt Pettitoes. She had eight of a family, four little girl pigs called Crosspatch, Suck Suck, Yok Yok and Spot, and four little boy pigs called Alexander, Pigling Bland, Chin Chin and Stumpy. Stumpy had had an accident to his tail. The eight little pigs had very fine appetites. <laughs> they eat, and indeed they do eat, said Aunt Pettitoes, looking at her family with pride. Suddenly there were fearful squeals. Alexander had squeezed inside the hoops of the pig trough and stuck. Aunt Pettitoes and I dragged him out by the hind legs. Chin Chin was already in disgrace. It was washing day, and he had eaten a bar of soap. And presently, in a basket of clean clothes, we found another dirty little pig. Crop, 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 whatever is this? grunted Aunt Pettitoes. No, all the pig family are pink, or pink with black spots. But this pig child was smutty black all over. When it had been popped into a tub, it proved to be Yok Yok. I went into the garden, and there I found Crosspatch and Suck Suck rooting up carrots. 
I whipped them myself and led them out by the ears. Crosspatch tried to bite me. Aunt Pettitoes, Aunt Pettitoes, you are a worthy person, but your family is not well brought up. Every one of them has been in mischief, except Spot and Pigling Bland. <laughs> yes, yes, sighed Aunt Pettitoes. And they drink bucketfuls of milk. I shall have to get another cow. Good little Spot shall stay at home to do the housework, but the others must go. Four little boy pigs and four little girl pigs are too many altogether. Yush, 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 said Aunt Pettitoes. There will be more to eat without them. So Chin Chin and Suck Suck went away in a wheelbarrow, and Stumpy, Yok Yok, and Crosspatch rode away in a cart. The other two little boy pigs, Pigling Bland and Alexander, went to market. We brushed their coats, we curled their tails, and washed their little faces, and we wished them good-bye in the yard. Aunt Pettitoes wiped her eyes with a large pocket handkerchief. Then she wiped Pigling Bland's nose and shed tears. Then she wiped Alexander's nose and shed tears. Then she passed the handkerchief to Spot. Aunt Pettitoes sighed and grunted, and addressed those little pigs as follows. <laughs> Now, Pigling Bland, son Pigling Bland, you must go to market. Take your brother Alexander by the hand. Mind your Sunday clothes, and remember to blow your nose. Aunt Pettitoes passed round the handkerchief again. Beware of traps, hen roosts, bacon, and eggs. Always walk upon your hind legs. Pigling Bland, who was a sedate little pig, looked solemnly at his mother. A tear trickled down his cheek. Aunt Pettitoes turned to the other. <laughs> now, sudden Alexander, take the hand. Wee, 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 giggled Alexander. Take the hand of your brother, Pigling Bland. <laughs> you must go to market. Mind. Wee, 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 interrupted Alexander again. You put me out, said Aunt Pettitoes. <laughs> Observe signposts and milestones. Uh, do not gobble herring bones. And remember, said I impressively, if you once cross the county boundary, you cannot come back. Alexander, you are not attending. Here are two licenses permitting two pigs to go to market in Lancashire. Attend, Alexander. I have had no end of trouble in getting these papers from the policeman. Pigling Bland listened gravely. Alexander was hopelessly volatile. I pinned the papers for safety inside their waistcoat pockets. Aunt Pettitoes gave to each a little bundle. Eight conversation peppermints with appropriate moral sentiments in screws of paper. Then they started. Pigling Bland and Alexander trotted along steadily for a mile. At least Pigling Bland did. Alexander made the road half as long again by skipping from side to side. He danced about and pinched his brother, singing, This pig went to market. This pig stayed at home. This pig had a bit of meat. Let's see what they have given... Us for dinner, Pigling. Pigling Bland and Alexander sat down and untied their bundles. Alexander gobbled up his dinner in no time. He had already eaten all his own peppermints. Give me one of yours, please, Pigling. But I wish to preserve them for emergencies, said Pigling Bland doubtfully. Alexander went into squeals of laughter. Then he pricked Pigling with the pin that had fastened his pig paper, and when Pigling slapped him, he dropped the pin and tried to take Pigling's pin, and the papers got mixed up. Pigling Bland reproved Alexander. 
but presently they made it up again, and trotted away together, singing, Pom Tom the piper's son stole a pig, and away he ran, but all the tune that he could play was over the hills and far away. What's that, young sirs? Stole a pig? Where are your licenses? said the policeman. They had nearly run against him round a corner. Pigling Bland pulled out his paper. Alexander, after fumbling, handed over something scrumply. For two and a half ounces conversation, sweeties, at three farthings? What's this? This ain't a license. Alexander's nose lengthened visibly. He had lost it. I had one. Indeed I had, Mr. Policeman. It's not likely they let you start without. I'm passing the farm. You may walk with me. Can I come back too? inquired Pigling Bland. I see no reason, young sir. Your paper is all right. Pigling Bland did not like going on alone, and it was beginning to rain. But it is unwise to argue with the police. He gave his brother a peppermint and watched him out of sight. To conclude the adventures of Alexander, the policeman sauntered up to the house about tea-time, followed by a damp, subdued little pig. I disposed of Alexander in the neighbourhood. He did fairly well when he had settled down. Pigling Bland went on alone dejectedly. He came to crossroads and a signpost to Market Town five miles. Over the hills four miles to Petitot's farm, three miles. Pigling Bland was shocked. There was little hope of sleeping in Market Town, and tomorrow was the hiring fair. It was deplorable to think how much time had been wasted by the frivolity of Alexander. He glanced wistfully along the road towards the hills, and then set off walking obediently the other way buttoning up his coat against the rain. He had never wanted to go, and the idea of standing by himself in a crowded market, to be stared at, pushed, and hired by some big strange farmer, was very disagreeable. "'I wish I could have a little garden and grow potatoes,' said Pigling Bland." He put his cold hand in his pocket and felt his paper. He put his other hand in his other pocket and felt another paper, Alexander's. Pigling squealed, then ran back frantically, hoping to overtake Alexander and the policeman. He took a wrong turn, several wrong turns, and was quite lost. It grew dark. The wind whistled, the trees creaked and groaned. Pigling Bland became frightened and cried, Wee, 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 I can't find my way home. After an hour's wandering, he got out of the wood. The moon shone through the clouds, and Pigling Bland saw a country that was new to him. The road crossed a moor. Below was a wide valley with a river twinkling in the moonlight, and beyond, in misty distance, lay the hills. He saw a small wooden hut, made his way to it, and crept inside. "'I'm afraid it is a hen-house, but what can I do?' said Pigling Bland, wet and cold and quite tired out. "'Bacon and eggs, bacon and eggs!' Plucked a hen on a perch. Trap, 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 cackle, 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 scolded a disturbed cockerel. To market, to market, jiggity jig, clucked a broody white hen roosting next to him. Pigling Bland, much alarmed, determined to leave at daybreak. In the meantime, he and the hens fell asleep. In less than an hour they were all awakened. The owner... Mr. Peter Thomas Piperson 
came with a lantern and a hamper to catch six fowls to take to market in the morning. He grabbed the white hen roosting next to the cock. Then his eye fell upon Pigling Bland, squeezed up in a corner. He made a singular remark. Hello, here's another. Seized Pigling by the scruff of the neck and dropped him into his hamper. Then he dropped in five more dirty, kicking, cackling hens on top of Pigling Bland. The hamper containing six fowls and a young pig was no light weight. It was taken downhill, unsteadily, with jerks. Pigling, although nearly scratched to pieces, contrived to hide the papers and peppermints inside his clothes. At last the hamper was bumped down upon a kitchen floor, the lid was opened, and Pigling was lifted out. He looked up blinking, and saw an offensively ugly elderly man grinning from ear to ear. "'This one's come of himself, whatever,' said Mr. Piperson, turning Pigling's pockets inside out. He pushed the hamper into a corner, threw a sack over it to keep the hens quiet, put a pot on the fire, and unlaced his boots. Pigling Bland drew forward a copy-stool, sat on the edge of it, shyly warming his hands. Mr. Piperson pulled off a boot and threw it against the wainscot at the further end of the kitchen. There was a smothered noise. "'Shut up!' said Mr. Piperson. Pigling Bland warmed his hands and eyed him. Mr. Piperson pulled off the other boot and flung it after the first. There was again a curious noise. "'Be quiet, will you?' said Mr. Piperson. Pigling Bland sat on the very edge of the copy-stool. Mr. Piperson fetched meal from a chest and made porridge. It seemed to Pigling that something at the further end of the kitchen was taking a suppressed interest in the cooking, but he was too hungry to be troubled by noises. Mr. Piperson poured out three platefuls, for himself, for Pigling, and a third, after glaring at Pigling, he put away with much scuffling and locked up. Pigling Bland ate his supper discreetly. After supper, Mr. Piperson consulted an almanac and felt Pigling's ribs. It was too late in the season for curing bacon, and he grudged his meal. Besides, the hens had seen this pig. He looked at the small remains of a flitch, and then looked undecidedly at Pigling. "'You may sleep on the rug,' said Mr. Peter Thomas Piperson. Pigling Bland slept like a top. In the morning Mr. Piperson made more porridge. The weather was warmer. He looked to see how much meal was left in the chest, and seemed dissatisfied. "'You'll likely be moving on again,' he said to Pigling Bland. Before Pigling could reply, a neighbour, who was giving Mr. Piperson and the hens a lift, whistled from the gate. Mr. Piperson hurried out with the hamper, enjoining Piglet to shut the door behind him and not meddle with naught, or I'll come back and skin ye, said Mr. Piperson. It crossed Pigling's mind that if he had asked for a lift too, he might still have been in time for market. But he distrusted Peter Thomas. After finishing breakfast at his leisure, Pigling had a look round the cottage. Everything was locked up. He found some potato peelings in a bucket in the back kitchen. Pigling ate the peel and washed up the porridge plates in the bucket. He sang while he worked. Tom with his pipe made such a noise, he called up all the girls and boys, and they all ran to hear him play over the hills and far away. 
Suddenly, a little smothered voice chimed in. Over the hill and a great way off, the wind shall blow my top mop off. <laughs> Pigling Bland put down a plate which he was wiping and listened. After a long pause, Pigling went on tiptoe and peered round the door in the front kitchen. There was nobody there. After another pause, Pigling approached the door of the locked cupboard and snuffed at the keyhole. It was quite quiet. After another long pause, Pigling pushed a peppermint under the door. It was sucked in immediately. In the course of the day, Pigling pushed in all the remaining six peppermints. When Mr. Piperson returned, he found Pigling sitting before the fire. He had brushed up the hearth and put on the pot to boil. The meal was not get atable. Mr. Piperson was very affable. He slapped Pigling on the back, made lots of porridge, and forgot to lock the meal chest. He did lock the cupboard door, but without properly shutting it. He went to bed early, and told Pigling upon no account to disturb him next day before twelve o'clock. Pigling Bland sat by the fire, eating his supper. All at once, at his elbow, a little voice spoke. My name is Pigwig. Make me more porridge, please. Pigling Bland jumped and looked around. A perfectly lovely little black Berkshire pig stood smiling beside him. She had twinkly little screwed-up eyes, a double chin, and a short turned-up nose. She pointed at Pigling's plate. He hastily gave it to her and fled to the meal-chest. "'How did you come here?' asked Pigling Bland. "'Stolen,' replied Pigwig, with her mouth full. Pigling helped himself to meal without scruple. "'What for?' "'Bacon, hams,' replied Pigwig cheerfully. "'Why on earth don't you run away?' exclaimed the horrified Pigling. "'I shall after supper,' said Pigwig decidedly. Pigling Bland made more porridge and watched her shyly. She finished a second plate, got up and looked about her, as though she were going to start. "'You can't go in the dark,' said Pigling Bland. Pigwig looked anxious. "'Do you know your way by daylight? I know we can see this little white house from the hills across the river. Which way are you going, Mr. Pig?' "'To market. I have two pig-papers. "'I might take you to the bridge, if you have no objection,' "'said Pigling, much confused and sitting on the edge of his copy-stool. "'Pigwig's gratitude was such, and she asked so many questions "'that it became embarrassing to Pigling Bland. "'He was obliged to shut his eyes and pretend to sleep. "'She became quiet.' and there was a smell of peppermint. "'I thought you had eaten them,' said Pigling, waking suddenly. "'Only the corners,' replied Pigwig, studying the sentiments with much interest by the firelight. "'I wish you wouldn't. He might smell them through the ceiling,' said the alarmed Pigling. Pigwig put back the sticky peppermints into her pocket. "'Sing something,' she demanded. "'I am sorry. I have toothache,' said Pigling, much dismayed. "'Then I will sing,' replied Pigwig. "'You will not mind if I say idiotity. I have forgotten some of the words.' Pigling Bland made no objection. He sat with his eyes half shut and watched her. She wagged her head and rocked about, clapping time and singing in a sweet little grunty voice. A funny old mother pig lived in a sty, and three little piggies had she. Tiddy, iddy, 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 umph, 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 and the pig said, wee, wee. She sang successfully through three or four verses, 
Only at every verse her head nodded a little lower, and her little twinkly eyes closed up. Those three little piggies grew peaky and lean, and lean they might very well be, for somehow they couldn't say umph, 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 and they wouldn't say wee, 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 for somehow they couldn't say... Pigwig's head bobbed lower and lower until she rolled over a little round ball, fast asleep on the hearth rug. Pigling Bland, on tiptoe, covered her up with an antimacassar. He was afraid to go to sleep himself. For the rest of the night he sat listening to the chirping of the crickets and to the snores of Mr. Piperson overhead. Early in the morning, between dark and daylight, Pigling tied up his little bundle and woke up Pigwig. She was excited and half frightened. But it's dark. How can we find our way? The cock has crowed. We must start before the hens come out. They might shout to Mr. Piperson. Pigwig sat down again and commenced to cry. Come away, Pigwig. We can see when we get used to it. Come, I can hear them clucking. Pigling had never said shoo to a hen in his life, being peaceable. Also, he remembered the hamper. He opened the house door quietly and shut it after them. There was no garden. The neighbourhood of Mr. Piperson's was all scratched up by fowls. They slipped away, hand in hand, across an untidy field to the road. The sun rose while they were crossing the moor, a dazzle of light over the tops of the hills. The sunshine crept down the slopes into the peaceful green valleys, where little white cottages nestled in gardens and orchards. "'That's Westmoreland,' said Pigwig. She dropped Pigling's hand and commenced to dance, singing, Tom, Tom, the piper's son, stole a pig and away he ran, but all the tune that he could play was over the hills and far away. Come, Pigwig, we must get to the bridge before folks are stirring. Why do you want to go to market, Pigling? inquired Pigwig presently. I don't. I want to grow potatoes. Have a peppermint, said Pigwig. Pigling Bland refused quite crossly. Does your poor toothy hurt? inquired Pigwig. Pigling Bland grunted. Pigwig ate the peppermint herself and followed the opposite side of the road. Pigwig, keep under the wall. There's a man ploughing. Pigwig crossed over. They hurried downhill towards the county boundary. Suddenly, Pigling stopped. He heard wheels. Slowly jogging up the road below them came a tradesman's cart. The reins flapped on the horse's back. The grocer was reading a newspaper. Take that peppermint out of your mouth, Pigwig. We may have to run. Don't say one word. Leave it to me. And in sight of the bridge, said poor Pigling, nearly crying. He began to walk frightfully lame, holding Pigwig's arm. The grocer, intent upon his newspaper, might have passed them if his horse had not shied and snorted. He pulled the cart crossways and held the whip. Hello. Where are you going to? Pigling Bland stared at him vacantly. Are you deaf? Are you going to mark it? Pigling nodded slowly. I thought as much. It was yesterday. Show me your license. Pigling stared at the off-hind shoe of the grocer's horse, which had picked up a stone. The grocer flicked his whip. Papers, pig license. Pigling fumbled in all his pockets and handed up the papers. The grocer read them, but still seemed dissatisfied. 
This here pig is a young lady. Is her name Alexander? Pigwig opened her mouth and shut it again. Pigling coughed asthmatically. The grocer ran his finger down the advertisement column of his newspaper. Lost, stolen, or strayed, ten shillings reward. He looked suspiciously at Pigwig. Then he stood up in the trap and whistled for the ploughman. You wait here while I drive on and speak to him," said the grocer, gathering up the reins. He knew that pigs are slippery, but surely such a very lame pig could never run. Not yet, Pigwig. He will look back. The grocer did so. He saw the two pigs stock still in the middle of the road. Then he looked over at his horse's heels. It was lame also. The stone took some time to knock out after he got to the ploughman. Now, Pigwig, now," said Pigling Bland. Never did any pigs run as those pigs ran. They raced and squealed and pelted down the long white hill towards the bridge. Little fat Pigwig's petticoats fluttered, and her feet went pitter patter pitter as she bounded and jumped. They ran and they ran and they ran down the hill, and across a short cut on level green turf at the bottom. Between pebble beds and rushes, they came to the river. They came to the bridge. They crossed it hand in hand. Then, over the hills and far away, she danced with Pigling Bland. End of the tale of Pigling Bland by Beatrix Potter. Snow White and Rose Red by the Brothers Grimm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There was once a poor widow who lived in a lonely cottage. In front of the cottage was a garden wherein stood two rose trees, one of which bore white and the other red roses. She had two children who were like the two rose trees, and one was called Snow White and the other Rose Red. They were as good and happy, as busy and cheerful as ever two children in the world were. Only Snow White was more quiet and gentle than Rose Red. Rose Red liked better to run about in the meadows and fields, seeking flowers and catching butterflies. But Snow White sat at home with her mother and helped her with housework or read to her when there was nothing to do. The two children were so fond of one another that they always held each other by the hand when they went out together. And when Snow White said, "We will not leave each other," Rose Red answered, "Never so long as we live." And their mother would add, "What one has, she must share with the other." They often ran about the forest alone and gathered red berries, and no beast did them any harm, but came close to them trustfully. The little hare would eat a cabbage leaf out of their hands. The roe grazed by their side, the stag leapt merrily by them, and the birds sat upon the boughs and sang whatever they knew. No mishap overtook them. If they had stayed too late in the forest and night came on, they laid themselves down near one another upon the moss and slept until morning came. And their mother knew this and did not worry on their account. Once, when they had spent the night in the forest and the dawn had roused them. They saw a beautiful child in a shining white dress sitting near their bed. He got up and looked quite kindly at them, but said nothing and went into the forest. And when they looked round, they found that they had been sleeping quite close to a precipice and would certainly have fallen into it in the darkness if they had gone only a few paces further. And their mother told them that it must have been the angel who watches over good children. Snow White and Rose Red kept their mother's little cottage so neat that it was a pleasure to look inside it. In summer, Rose Red took care of the house, and every morning laid a wreath of flowers by her mother's bed before she awoke, in which was a rose from each tree. In the winter, Snow White lit the fire and hung the kettle on the hob. The kettle was of brass and shone like gold, 
so brightly was it polished. In the evening, when the snowflakes fell, the mother said, Go, Snow White, and bolt the door. And then they sat round the hearth, and the mother took her spectacles and read aloud out of a large book, and the two girls listened as they sat and spun. And close by them lay a lamb upon the floor, and behind them upon a perch sat a white dove, with its head hidden beneath its wings. One evening, as they were thus sitting comfortably together, some one knocked at the door as if he wished to be let in. The mother said, Quick, Rose Red, open the door, it must be a traveller who is seeking shelter. Rose Red went and pushed back the bolt, thinking that it was a poor man, but it was not. It was a bear that stretched his broad black head within the door. Rose Red screamed and sprang back. The lamb bleated, the dove fluttered, and Snow White hid herself behind her mother's bed. But the bear began to speak and said, Do not be afraid. I will do you no harm. I am half frozen and only want to warm myself a little beside you. Poor bear, said the mother. Lie down by the fire, only take care that you do not burn your coat. Then she cried, Snow White, Rose Red, come out, the bear will do you no harm. He means well. So they both came out, and by and by the lamb and the dove came nearer, and were not afraid of him. The bear said, Here, children, knock the snow out of my coat a little. So they brought a broom and swept the bear's hide clean, and he stretched himself by the fire and growled contentedly and comfortably. It was not long before they grew quite at home, and played tricks with their clumsy guest. They tugged his hair with their hands, put their feet upon his back, and rolled him about, or they took a hazel switch and beat him, and when he growled they laughed. But the bear took it all in good part. Only when they were too rough he called out, "'Leave me alive, children! Snow White, Rose Red, will you beat your we were dead?' When it was bedtime and the others went to bed, the mother said to the bear, "'You lie there by the hearth, and then you will be safe from the cold and the bad weather.' As soon as day dawned, the two children let him out, and trotted across the snow into the forest. Henceforth the bear came every evening at the same time, laid himself down by the hearth, and let the children amuse themselves with him as much as they liked, and they got so used to him that the doors were never fastened until their black friend had arrived. When spring had come and all outside was green, the bear said one morning to Snow White, "'Now I must go away and cannot come back for the whole summer.' "'Where are you going then, dear bear?' asked Snow White. "'I must go into the forest and guard my treasures from wicked dwarves. "'In the winter, when the earth is frozen hard, "'they are obliged to stay below and cannot work their way through. "'But now, when the sun has thawed and warmed the earth, "'they break through it and come out to pry and steal, "'and what once gets into their hands and in their caves "'does not easily see daylight again.' "'Snow White was quite sorry at his departure, "'and as she unbolted the door for him and the bear was hurrying out, he caught against the bolt, and a piece of his hairy coat was torn off, and it seemed to Snow White as if she had seen gold shining through it. But she was not sure about it. The bear ran away quickly, and was soon out of sight behind the trees. A short time afterwards, the mother sent her children into the forest to get firewood. There they found a big tree, which lay felled on the ground, and close by the trunk something was jumping backwards and forwards in the grass, but they could not make out what it was. When they came nearer, they saw a dwarf with an old withered face and a snow-white beard a yard long. The end of the beard was caught in a crevice of the tree, and the little fellow was jumping about like a dog tied to a rope, and did not know what to do. He glared at the girls with fiery red eyes and cried, "'Why do you stand there? Can you not come here and help me?' "'What are you up to, little man?' asked Rose Red. "'You stupid prying goose!' answered the dwarf. I was going to split the tree to get a little wood for cooking. The little bit of food we people get is immediately burnt up with heavy logs. We do not swallow so much as you coarse, greedy folks. I had just driven my wedge safely in, and everything was going as I wished. But the cursed wedge was too smooth and suddenly sprang out, and the tree closed so quickly that I could not pull out my beautiful white beard. So now it is tight, and I cannot get away. "'and the silly, sleek, milk-faced things laugh. "'Ugh! How odious you are!' "'The children tried very hard, but they could not pull the beard out. "'It was caught too fast. "'I will run and fetch someone,' said Rose Red. "'You senseless goose!' 
snarled the dwarf. Why should you fetch someone? You are already too, too many for me. Can you not think of something better? Don't be impatient, said Snow White. I will help you. And she pulled her scissors out of her pocket and cut off the end of the beard. As soon as the dwarf felt himself free, he laid hold of the bag which lay among the roots of the trees, and which was full of gold, and lifted it up, grumbling to himself, Uncouth people, to cut off a piece of my fine beard, bad luck to you! And then he swung his bag upon his back, and went off without even once looking at the children. Some time afterwards, Snow White and Rose Red went to catch a dish of fish. As they came near the brook, they saw something like a large grasshopper jumping towards the water, as if it were going to leap in. They ran to it and found it was the dwarf. "'Where are you going?' said Rose Red. "'You surely don't want to go into the water.' "'I am not such a fool!' cried the dwarf. "'Don't you see that accursed fish wants to pull me in?' The little man had been sitting there fishing, and unluckily the wind had tangled up his beard with the fishing line. A moment later, a big fish made a bite, and the feeble creature had not strength to pull it out. The fish kept the upper hand, and pulled the dwarf towards him. He held on to all the reeds and rushes, but it was of little good, for he was forced to follow the movements of the fish, and was in urgent danger of being dragged into the water. The girls came just in time. They held him fast, and tried to free his beard from the line, but all in vain— Beard and line were entangled fast together. There was nothing to do but bring out the scissors and cut the beard, whereby a small part of it was lost. When the dwarf saw that, he screamed out, Is it civil, you toadstool, to disfigure a man's face? Was it not enough to clip off the end of my beard? Now you've cut off the best part of it. I cannot let myself be seen by my people. I wish you had been made to run the soles off your shoes. Then he took out a sack of pearls which lay in the rushes, and without another word he dragged it away and disappeared behind a stone. It happened that soon afterwards the mother sent the two children to town to buy needles and thread and lace and ribbons. The road led them across a heath upon which huge pieces of rock lay strewn about. There they noticed a large bird hovering in the air, flying slowly round and round above them. It sank lower and lower, and at last settled near a rock not far away. Immediately they heard a loud, piteous cry. They ran up, and saw with horror that the eagle had seized their old acquaintance, the dwarf, and was going to carry him off. The children, full of pity, at once took hold of the little man, and pulled against the eagle so long that at last he let his booty go. As soon as the dwarf had recovered from his first fright, he cried with a shrill voice, "'Could you not have done it more carefully? "'You dragged at my brown coat "'so that it is all torn and full of holes. "'You clumsy creatures!' "'Then he took up a sack of precious stones "'and slipped away again under the rock into his hole. "'The girls, who by this time were used to his ingratitude, "'went on their way and did their business in town. "'As they crossed the heath again on their way home, "'they surprised the dwarf, "'who had emptied out his bag of precious stones into a clean spot, "'and had not thought that anyone would come there so late. "'The evening sun shone upon the brilliant stones. "'They glittered and sparkled with all colours so beautifully "'that the children stood still and stared at them. "'Why do you stand gaping there?' cried the dwarf, "'and his ashen grey face became copper-red with rage. He was still cursing when a loud growling was heard, and a black bear came trotting towards them out of the forest. The dwarf sprang up in fright, but he could not reach his cave, for the bear was already close. Then, in the dread of his heart, he cried, "'Dear Mr. Bear, spare me! I will give you all my treasures. Look, the beautiful jewels lying there! Grant me my life!' "'What do you want with such a slender little fellow as I? "'You would not feel me between your teeth. "'Come, take these two wicked girls. "'They are tender morsels for you, fat as young quails. "'For mercy's sake, eat them!' "'The bear took no heed of his words, "'but gave the wicked creature a single blow with his paw, "'and he did not move again. "'The girls had run away, but the bear called to them. "'Snow White and Rose Red, do not be afraid. "'Wait, I will come with you.' Then they recognised his voice and waited, and when he came up to them, suddenly his bear skin fell off, 
and he stood there a handsome man clothed all in gold i am a king's son he said and i was bewitched by that wicked dwarf who had stolen my treasures i have had to run about the forest as a savage bear until i was freed by his death now he has got his well-deserved punishment snow white was married to him and rose red to his brother and they divided between them the great treasure which the dwarf had carried together in his cave the old mother lived peacefully and happily with her children for many years she took the two rose trees with her and they stood before her window and every year bore the most beautiful roses white and red end of snow white and rose red by the brothers grimm read by verity kendall The Story of Miss Moppet by Beatrix Potter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of Miss Moppet This is a pussy called Miss Moppet. She thinks she has heard a mouse. This is a mouse peeping out behind the cupboard and making fun of Miss Moppet. He is not afraid of a kitten. This is Miss Moppet jumping just too late. She misses the mouse and hits her own head. She thinks it is a very hard cupboard. The mouse watches Miss Moppet from the top of the cupboard. Miss Moppet ties up her head in a duster and sits before the fire. The mouse thinks she is looking very ill. He comes sliding down the bell pool. Miss Moppet looks worse and worse. The mouse comes a little nearer. Miss Moppet holds her poor head in her paws and looks at him through a hole in the duster. The mouse comes very close. And then, all of a sudden, Miss Moppet jumps upon the mouse. And, because the mouse has teased Miss Moppet, Miss Moppet thinks she will tease the mouse, which is not at all nice of Miss Moppet. She ties him up in the duster and tosses it about like a ball. But she forgot about that hole in the duster, and when she untied it, there is no mouse. He has wriggled out and run away, and he is dancing a jig on the top of the cupboard. The End End of the Story of Miss Moppet by Beatrix Potter Story of the Silly Lamb by Anna Letitia Barbold this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chad Horner. I will tell you a story about a lamb. There was once a shepherd who had a great many sheep and lambs. He took a great deal of care of them and gave them sweet, fresh grass to eat and clear water to drink. And if they were sick, he was very good to them. And when they climbed up a deep hill and the lambs were tired, he used to carry them in his arms. And when they were all eating their suppers in the field, he used to sit upon a stile and play with them a chin and sing to them. And so they were the happiest sheep and lambs in the whole world. But every night the shepherd used to pen them up in a fold. Do you know what a sheepfold is? Well, I will tell you. It is a place like the court, but instead of pails, there are hurdles, which are made of sticks that will bend, such as osier twigs, and they are twisted and made very fast so that nothing can creep in and nothing can get out. Well, and so every night, when it grew dark and cold, the shepherd called all his flock, sheep and lambs, together and drove them into the fold and penned them up, and there they lay, as snug and warm and as comfortable as could be, and nothing could get into and hurt them. And the dogs lay round on the outside to guard them, and to bark if anybody came near. And in the morning the shepherd unpenned the fold, and let them all out again. Now, they were all very happy, as I told you, and loved the shepherd dearly, that was so good to them, all except one foolish little lamb. And this lamb did not like to be shut up every night in the fold, and she came to her mother, who was a wise old sheep, and said to her, I wonder why we are shut up so every night. The dogs are not shut up, and why should we be shut up? 
I think it is very hard, and I will get away if I can. I am resolved, for if I like to run about where I please, and I think it is very pleasant in the woods by moonlight. Then the old sheep said to her, You are very silly, you little lamb. You had better stay in the fold. The shepherd is so good to us, that we should always do as he bids us. So if you wander about by yourself, I dare say you will come to some harm. I dare say not, said the little lamb. And so when the evening came and the shepherd called them all to come into the fold, she would not come, but crept slyly under the hedge and hid herself. And when the rest of the lambs were all in the fold and fast asleep, she came out and jumped and frisked and danced about, and she got out of the field and got into the forest full of trees. And the very fierce wolf came rushing out of a cave and howled very loud. Then the silly lamb wished she had been shut up in the fold. But the fold was a great way off, and the wolf saw her and seized her and carried her away to a dismal dark den, all covered with bones and blood. And there the wolf had two cubs, and the wolf said to them, Here I have brought you a young fat lamb. And so the cubs took her and growled over her a little while, and then tore her to pieces and ate her up. End of Story of the Silly Lamb The Story of the Three Bears by Flora Annie Steele This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Three Bears Once upon a time there were three bears, who lived together in a house of their own in a wood. One of them was a little wee bear, and one was a middle-sized bear, and the other was a great big bear. They had each a bowl for their porridge, a little bowl for the little wee bear, and a middle-sized bowl for the middle-sized bear, and a great bowl for the great big bear. And they had each a chair to sit in, a little chair for the little wee bear, and a middle-sized chair for the middle-sized bear, and a great chair for the great big bear and they had each a bed to sleep in. A little bed for the little wee bear, and a middle-sized bed for the middle-sized bear, and a great bed for the great big bear. One day, after they had made the porridge for their breakfast, and poured it into their porridge bowls, they walked out into the wood while the porridge was cooling, that they might not burn their mouths by beginning too soon, for they were polite, well brought up bears. And while they were away, a little girl called Goldilocks, who lived at the other side of the wood and had been sent on an errand by her mother, passed by the house and looked in at the window. And then she peeped in at the keyhole, for she was not at all a well brought up little girl. Then seeing nobody in the house, she lifted the latch. The door was not fastened, because the bears were good bears who did nobody any harm, and never suspected that anybody would harm them. So Goldilocks opened the door and went in, and well pleased was she when she saw the porridge on the table. If she had been a well-brought-up little girl, she would have waited till the bears came home, and then, perhaps, they would have asked her to breakfast, for they were good bears, a little rough or so, as the manner of bears is, but for all that, very good-natured and hospitable. But she was an impudent, rude little girl, and so she set about helping herself. First she tasted the porridge of the great big bear, and that was too hot for her. Next she tasted the porridge of the middle-sized bear, but that was too cold for her. And then she went to the porridge of the little wee bear and tasted it, and that was neither too hot nor too cold, but just right and she liked it so well that she ate it all up, every bit. Then Goldilocks, who was tired, for she had been catching butterflies instead of running on her errand, sat down in the chair of the great big bear, but that was too hard for her. And then she sat down in the chair of the middle-sized bear, and that was too soft for her. But when she sat down in the chair of the little wee bear, that was neither too hard nor too soft, but just right. So she seated herself in it, and there she sat till the bottom of the chair came out, and down she came, plump upon the ground. And that made her very cross, 
for she was a bad-tempered little girl. Now, being determined to rest, Goldilocks went upstairs into the bedchamber in which the three bears slept. And first she lay down upon the bed of the great big bear, but that was too high at the head for her. And next she lay down upon the bed of the middle-sized bear, and that was too high at the foot for her. And then she lay down upon the bed of the little wee bear, and that was neither too high at the head nor at the foot, but just right. So she covered herself up comfortably and lay there till she fell asleep. By this time the three bears thought their porridge would be cool enough for them to eat it properly, so they came home to breakfast. Now careless Goldilocks had left the spoon of the great big bear standing in his porridge. "'Somebody has been at my porridge,' said the great big bear in his great rough, gruff voice. Then the middle-sized bear looked at his porridge and saw the spoon was standing in it too. "'Somebody has been at my porridge!' said the middle-sized bear in his middle-sized voice. Then the little wee bear looked at his, and there was a spoon in the porridge bowl, but the porridge was all gone. "'Somebody has been at my porridge and has eaten it all up!' said the little wee bear in his little wee voice. Upon this the three bears, seeing that someone had entered their house and eaten up the little wee bear's breakfast, began to look about them. Now the careless Goldilocks had not put the hard cushion straight when she rose from the chair of the great big bear. "'Somebody has been sitting in my chair,' said the great big bear in his great rough gruff voice. And the careless Goldilocks had squatted down the soft cushion of the middle-sized bear. "'Somebody has been sitting in my chair,' said the middle-sized bear in his middle-sized voice. "'Somebody has been sitting in my chair and has sat the bottom through,' said the little wee bear in his little wee voice. Then the three bears thought they had better make further search in case it was a burglar, so they went upstairs into their bedchamber. Now Goldilocks had pulled the pillow of the great big bear out of its place. "'Somebody has been lying in my bed,' said the great big bear in his great rough, gruff voice." and Goldilocks had pulled the bolster of the middle-sized bear out of its place. "'Somebody has been lying in my bed,' said the middle-sized bear in his middle-sized voice. But when the little wee bear came to look at his bed, there was the bolster in its place, and the pillow was in its place upon the bolster, and upon the pillow there was Goldilocks's yellow head, which was not in place, for she had no business there. "'Somebody has been lying in my bed, and here she is still,' said the little wee bear in his little wee voice. Now Goldilocks had heard in her sleep the great, rough, gruff voice of the great big bear, but she was so fast asleep that it was no more to her than the roaring of wind or the rumbling of thunder. And she had heard the middle-sized voice of the middle-sized bear but it was only as if she had heard someone speaking in a dream. But when she heard the little wee voice of the little wee bear, it was so sharp and so shrill that it awakened her at once. Up she started, and when she saw the three bears on one side of the bed, she tumbled herself out at the other and ran to the window. Now the window was open because the bears, like good tidy bears as they were, always opened their bedchamber window when they got up in the morning. So naughty, frightened little Goldilocks jumped, and whether she broke her neck in the fall, or ran to the wood and was lost there, or found her way out of the wood and got whipped for being a bad girl and playing truant, no one can say. But the three bears never saw anything more of her. End of the Story of the Three Bears by Flora Annie Steele Sweet Porridge by Brothers Grimm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cat Attic. There was a poor, good little girl who lived alone with her mother, and they had nothing more to eat. So the child went into the forest, and an old woman met her, who knew of her sorrow, and gave her a little pot, which, when she said, Boil, little pot, boil! 
would cook good sweet porridge, and when she said, Stop, little pot, stop, it ceased to cook. The little girl took the pot home to her mother, and now they were freed from their poverty and hunger, and ate sweet porridge as often as they liked. Once on a time, when the little girl had gone out, the mother said, Boil, little pot, boil, and it began to cook, and she ate till she was satisfied. Then she wanted the pot to stop cooking, but did not know the word. So it went on cooking, and the porridge rose over the edge, and it still cooked on till the kitchen, and the whole house was full, and then the next house, and then the whole street, just as if it wanted to satisfy the hunger of the whole world. And there was the greatest trouble, and no one knew how to stop it. At last, when only a single house was left, the child came home and just said, Stop, little pot, stop, and it stopped cooking. And whosoever wished to return to the town had to eat his way back. End of Sweet Porridge by Brothers Grimm Recording by Cat Attic The Tale of Jemima Puddle Duck A Farmyard Tale for Ralph and Betsy by Beatrix Potter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tale of Jemima Puddle Duck, A Farmyard Tale for Ralph and Betsy What a funny sight it is to see a brood of ducklings with a hen! Listen to the story of Jemima Puddle Duck, who was annoyed because the farmer's wife would not let her hatch her own eggs. Her sister-in-law, Mrs. Rebecca Puddle Duck, was perfectly willing to leave the hatching to someone else. I have not the patience to sit on a nest for twenty-eight days, and no more have you, Jemima. You would let them go cold. You know you would. I wish to hatch my own eggs. I'll hatch them all by myself, quacked Jemima Pearl Duck. She tried to hide her eggs, but they were always found and carried off. Jemima Puddle Duck became quite desperate. She determined to make a nest right away from the farm. She set off on a fine spring afternoon along the cart road that leads over the hill. She was wearing a shawl and a poke bonnet. When she reached the top of the hill, she saw a wood in the distance. She thought that it looked a safe, quiet spot. Jemima Puddle Duck was not much in the habit of flying. She ran downhill a few yards, flapping her shawl, and then she jumped off into the air. She flew beautifully when she had got a good start. She skimmed along over the treetops until she saw an open place in the middle of the wood where the trees and brushwood had been cleared. Jemima alighted rather heavily and began to waddle about in search of a convenient dry nesting place. She rather fancied a tree stump amongst some tall foxgloves. But, seated upon the stump, she was startled to find an elegantly dressed gentleman reading a newspaper. He had black prick ears and sandy-colored whiskers. Quack! said Jemima Puddle Duck with her head and her bonnet on one side. Quack! The gentleman raised his eyes above his newspaper and looked curiously at Jemima. Madame, have you lost your way? said he. He had a long, bushy tail which he was sitting upon, as the stump was somewhat damp. Jemima thought him mighty civil and handsome. She explained that she had not lost her way, but that she was trying to find a convenient, dry nesting place. Ah, is that so? Indeed, said the gentleman with sandy whiskers, looking curiously at Jemima. He folded up the newspaper and put it in his coat-tail pocket. Jemima complained of the superfluous hen. Indeed, how interesting. I wish I could meet with that fowl. I would teach it to mind its own business. But, as to a nest, there is no difficulty. I have a sack full of feathers in my woodshed. No, my dear madame, you will be in nobody's way. You may sit there as long as you like said the bushy, long-tailed gentleman. He led the way to a very retired, dismal-looking house amongst the foxgloves. It was built of faggots and turf, and there are two broken pails, one on top of another, by way of a chimney. This, 
is my summer residence. You would not find my earth, my winter house, so convenient, said the hospitable gentleman. There is a tumble-down shed at the back of the house made of old soap boxes. The gentleman opened the door and showed Jemima in. The shed was almost quite full of feathers. It was almost suffocating, but it was comfortable and very soft. Jemima Puddle Duck was rather surprised to find such a vast quantity of feathers, but it was very comfortable, and she made a nest without any trouble at all. When she came out, the sandy-whiskered gentleman was sitting on the log reading the newspaper. At least he had it spread out, but he was looking over the top of it. He was so polite that he seemed almost sorry to let Jemima go home for the night. He promised to take great care of her nest until she came back again next day. He said he loved eggs and ducklings. He should be proud to see a fine nestful in his woodshed. Jemima Puddle Duck came every afternoon. She laid nine eggs in the nest. They were greeny white and very large. The foxy gentleman admired them immensely. He used to turn them over and count them when Jemima was not there. At last Jemima told him that she intended to begin to sit next day, and I will bring a bag of corn with me so that I need never leave my nest until the eggs are hatched. They might catch cold, said this conscientious Jemima. Madam, I beg you not to trouble yourself with a bag. I will provide oats. But before you commence your tedious sitting, I intend to give you a treat. Let us have a dinner party all to ourselves. May I ask you to bring up some herbs from the farm garden to make a savory omelet, sage and thyme and mint and two onions and some parsley? I will provide lard for the stuff lard for the omelet," said the hospitable gentleman with sandy whiskers. Jemima Puddle Duck was a simpleton; not even the mention of sage and onions made her suspicious. She went round the farm garden. Nibbling off snippets of all the different sort of herbs that are used for stuffing roast duck, and she waddled into the kitchen and got two onions out of a basket. The collie dog Cap met her coming out. "What are you doing with those onions? Where do you go every afternoon by yourself, Jemima Puddle Duck?" Jemima was rather in awe of the collie. She told him the whole story. The collie listened with his wise head on one side. He grinned when she described the polite gentleman with sandy whiskers. He asked several questions about the wood and about the exact position of the house and shed. Then he went out and trotted down the village. He went to look for two foxhound puppies who were out at walk with the butcher. Jemima Puddle Duck went up the cart road for the last time on a sunny afternoon. She was rather burdened with bunches of herbs and two onions in a bag. She flew over the wood and alighted opposite the house of the bushy, long-tailed gentleman. He was sitting on a log. He sniffed the air and kept glancing uneasily around the wood. When Jemima alighted, he quite jumped. "Come into the house as soon as you have looked at your eggs. Give me the herbs for the omelet. Be sharp." He was rather abrupt. Jemima Puddle Duck had never heard him speak like that. She felt surprised and uncomfortable. While she was inside, she heard pattering feet round the back of the shed. Someone with a black nose sniffed at the bottom of the door and then locked it. Jemima became much alarmed. A moment afterwards, there were most awful noises: barking, baying. Growls and howls, squealing and groans, and nothing more was ever seen of that foxy whiskered gentleman. Presently, Kep opened the door of the shed and let out Jemima Puddle Duck. Unfortunately, the puppies rushed in and gobbled up all the eggs before he could stop them. He had a bite on his ear, and both the puppies were limping. Jemima Puddle Duck was escorted home in tears on account of those eggs. She laid some more in June, and she was permitted to keep them herself, but only four of them hatched. 
Jemima Puddleduck said that it was because of her nurse, but she had always been a bad sitter. The end. End of the tale of Jemima Puddleduck, a farmyard tale for Ralph and Betsy by Beatrix Potter. The Tale of Peter Rabbit by Beatrix Potter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christina Maria Went. The Tale of Peter Rabbit. Once upon a time there were four little rabbits, and their names were Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. They lived with their mother in a sandbank, underneath the root of a very big fir tree. Now, my dears, said old Mrs. Rabbit one morning, you may go into the fields or down the lane, but don't go into Mr. McGregor's garden. Your father had an accident there. He was put in a pie by Mrs. McGregor. Now run along and don't get into mischief. I'm going out. Then old Mrs. Rabbit took a basket and her umbrella to the baker's. She bought a loaf of brown bread and five currant buns. Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail, who were good little bunnies, went down the lane to gather blackberries. But Peter, who was very naughty, ran straight away to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. First he ate some lettuces and some French beans, and then he ate some radishes. And then, feeling rather sick, he went to look for some parsley. But round the end of a cucumber frame, whom should he meet but Mr. McGregor? Mr. McGregor was on his hands and knees planting out young cabbages, but he jumped up and ran after Peter, waving a rake and calling out, Stop, thief! Peter was most dreadfully frightened. He rushed all over the garden, for he had forgotten the way back to the gate. He lost one of his shoes among the cabbages and the other shoe amongst the potatoes. After losing them, he ran on four legs and went faster, so that I think he might have got away altogether if he had not unfortunately ran into a gooseberry net and got caught by the large buttons on his jacket. It was a blue jacket with brass buttons, quite new. Peter gave himself up for lost and shed big tears, but his sobs were overheard by some friendly sparrows who flew to him in great excitement and implored him to exert himself. Mr. McGregor came up with a sieve, which he intended to pop upon the top of Peter, but Peter wriggled out just in time, leaving his jacket behind him, and rushed into the tool shed and jumped into a can. It would have been a beautiful thing to hide in if it had not had so much water in it. Mr. McGregor was quite sure that Peter was somewhere in the tool shed, perhaps hidden underneath the flower pot. He began to turn them over carefully, looking under each. Presently, Peter sneezed. Curdy shoe! Mr. McGregor was after him in no time. Anne tried to put his foot upon Peter, who jumped out of a window, upsetting three plants. The window was too small for Mr. McGregor, and he was tired of running after Peter. He went back to his work. Peter sat down to rest. He was out of breath and trembling with fright, and he had not the least idea of which way to go. Also, he was very damp with sitting in that can. After a time, he began to wander about, going lippity-lippity, not very fast and looking all around. He found a door in a wall, but it was locked and there was no room for a fat little rabbit to squeeze underneath. An old mouse was running in and out over the stone doorstep, carrying peas and beans to her family in the wood. Peter asked her the way to the gate, but she had such a large pea in her mouth that she could not answer. She only shook her head at him. Peter began to cry. Then he tried to find his way straight across the garden, but he became more and more puzzled. Presently he came to a pond where Mr. McGregor filled his water cans. A white cat was staring at some goldfish, she sat very, very still, but now and then the tip of her tail twitched as if it were alive. Peter thought it best to go away without speaking to her. He had heard about cats from his cousin, little Benjamin Bunny. He went back towards the tool shed, but suddenly, quite close to him, he heard the noise of a hoe. Scritch, scratch, scratch, scritch! Peter scuttered underneath the bushes, but presently, as nothing happened, he came out and climbed upon a wheelbarrow and peeped over. The first thing he saw was Mr. McGregor hoeing onions. His back was turned toward Peter, and beyond him was the gate. Peter got down very quietly off the wheelbarrow, and started running as fast as he could along a straight walk behind some black currant bushes. Mr. McGregor caught sight of him at the corner, but Peter did not care. He slipped underneath the gate and was safe at last in the wood outside the garden. Mr. McGregor hung up the little jacket and shoes for a scarecrow to frighten the blackbirds. Peter never stopped running or looked behind him till he got home to the big fir tree. He was so tired that he flopped down upon the nice soft sand on the floor of the rabbit hole and shut his eyes. His mother was busy cooking. She wondered what he had done with his clothes. 
It was the second little jacket and pair of shoes that Peter had lost in a fortnight. I am sorry to say that Peter was not very well during the evening. His mother put him to bed and made some chamomile tea, and she gave a dose of it to Peter. One tablespoonful to be taken at bedtime, but Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail had bread and milk and blackberries for supper. End of The Tale of Peter Rabbit by Beatrix Potter Recording by Christina Maria Wentz The Drop of Water by Hans Christian Andersen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What a magnifying glass is, you surely know. Such a round sort of spectacle glass that makes everything full a hundred times larger than it really is. When one holds it before the eye and looks at a drop of water out of the pond, then one sees above a thousand strange creatures. It looks almost like a whole plateful of shrimps springing about among each other, and they are so ravenous they tear one another's arms and legs, tails and sides, and yet they are glad and pleased in their way. Now there once was an old man who was called by everybody Creep and Crawl, for that was his name. He would always make the best out of everything, and when he would, could not make anything out of it, he resorted to witchcraft. Now one day he sat and held his magnifying glass before his eye and looked at a drop of water that was taken out of a little pond in the ditch. What a creeping and crawling was there! All the thousands of small creatures hopped and jumped about, pulled one another, and pecked one another. But this is abominable, said Creep and Crawl. Can one not get them to live in peace and quiet, and each mind his own business? And he thought and thought, but he could come to no conclusion, and so he was obliged to conjure. I must give them a color, that they may be more discernible, said he. And so he poured something like a little drop of red wine into the drop of water, but it was bewitched blood from the lobe of the ear. The very finest sort for a penny. And then all the strange creatures became rose-colored over the whole body. It looked like a whole town of naked savages. What have you got there, said another old wizard, who had no name, and that was just the best of it. Why, said Creep and Crawl, if you can guess what it is, I will make you a present of it but it is not so easy to find out when one does not know it. The wizard, who had no name, looked through the magnifying glass. It actually appeared like a whole town, where all the inhabitants ran about without clothes. It was terrible, but still more terrible to see how the one knocked and pushed the other, bit each other, and drew one another about. What was undermost should be topmost, and what was topmost should be undermost. See there now, his leg is no longer than mine. Whip it off and away with it. There is one that has a little lump behind the ear, a little innocent lump, but it pains him, and so it shall pain him still more. And they pecked at it, and they dragged him about, and they ate him, and all on account of the little lump. There sat one as still as a little maid, who only wished for peace and quietness. But she must be brought out, and they dragged her, and they pulled her, and they devoured her. It is quite amusing, said the wizard. Yes, but what do you think it is, asked Creep and Crawl. Can you find it out? It was very easy to see, said the other. It is some great city. They all resemble each other. A great city it is, that's sure. It is ditch water, said Creep and Crawl. End of The Drop of Water by Hans Christian Andersen The Happy Family by Hans Christian Andersen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Really, the largest green leaf in this country is a dock leaf. If one holds it before one, it is like a whole apron, 
and if one holds it over one's head in rainy weather, it is almost as good as an umbrella, for it is so immensely large. The burdock never grows alone, but where there grows one, there always grows several. It is a great delight, and all this delightfulness is snail's food. The great white snails, which persons of quality in former times made fricassees of and ate, and said, hmm, <laughs> how delicious, for they thought it tasted so delicate, lived on dock leaves, and therefore burdock seeds were sown. Now there was an old manor house where they no longer ate snails. They were quite extinct, but the burdocks were not extinct. They grew and grew all over the walks and all the beds. They could not get the mastery over them. It was a whole forest of burdocks. Here and there stood an apple and a plum tree, or else one never would have thought that it was a garden. All was burdocks, and there lived the last two venerable old snails. They themselves knew not how old they were, but they could remember very well that there had been many more, that they were of a family from foreign lands, and that for them and theirs the whole forest was planted. They had never been outside it, but they knew that there was still something more in the world, which was called the manor house, and that there they were boiled, and then they became black, and were then placed on a silver dish, and what happened further they knew not, or in fact, what it was to be boiled, or to lie on a silver dish, that could not possibly imagine, but it was said to be delightful, and particularly genteel. Neither the chafers, the toads, nor the earthworms whom they asked about it could give them any information. None of them had been boiled or laid on a silver dish. The old white snails were the first persons of distinction in the world that they knew. The forest was planted for their sake, and the manor house was there that they might be boiled and laid on a silver dish. Now they lived a very lonely and happy life. And as they had no children themselves, they had adopted a little common snail, which they brought up as their own. But the little one would not grow, for he was of a common family. But the old ones, especially Dame Mother Snail, thought that they could observe how he increased in size. And she begged father, if he could not see it, that he would at least feel the little snail's shell, and that he felt it and found the good dame was right. One day there was a heavy storm of rain. Hear how it beats like a drum on the dock leaves, said Father Snail. There are also raindrops, said Mother Snail, and now the rain pours right down the stalk. You will see that it will be wet there. I am very happy to think that we have our good house, and the little one has also his. There is more done for us than for all other creatures, sure enough. But can you not see that, that we are the folks of the quality in the world? We are provided with a house from our birth, and the burdock forest is planted for our sakes? I should like to know how far it extends and where there is outside. There is nothing at all, said Father Snail. No place can be better than ours, and I have nothing to wish for. Yes, said the dame. I would be willing to go to the manor house, be boiled and laid on a silver dish. All our forefathers have been treated so. There is something extraordinary in it, you may be sure. The manor house has most likely fallen to ruin, said Father Snail, or the burdocks have grown up over it, so that they cannot come out. There need not, however, be any haste about that. But you are always in such a tremendous hurry and the little one is beginning to be the same. Has he not been creeping up the stalk all these three days? It gives me a headache when I look up to him. You must not scold him, said Mother Snail. He creeps so carefully. He will afford us much pleasure, and we have nothing but him to live for. But have you not thought of it? Where shall we get a wife for him? Do you not think that there are some of our species at a great distance in the interior of the burdock forest? Black snails, I dare say, there are enough of, said the old one. Black snails without a house, but they are so common and so conceited. But we might give the ants a commission to look out for us. They run to and fro as if they had something to do, 
and they certainly know of a wife for our little snail. I know one sure enough, the most charming one, said one of the ants, but I am afraid we shall hardly succeed, for she is a queen. That is nothing, said the old folks. Has she a house? She has a palace, said the ant, the finest ant's palace with seven hundred passages. I thank you, said Mother Snail. Our son shall not go out into an ant hill. If you know nothing better than that, we shall give the commission to the white gnats. They fly far and wide in rain and sunshine. They know the whole forest here, both within and without. We have a wife for him, said the gnats. At a hundred human paces from here, there sits a little snail in her house on a gooseberry bush. She is quite lonely, and an old enough to be married, it is only a hundred human paces. Well, then let her come to him, said the old ones. He has a whole forest of burdocks. She has only a bush. And so they went and fetched little Miss Snail. It was a whole week before she arrived, but therein was just the very best of it, for one could see that she was of the same species. And then the marriage was celebrated. Six earthworms shone as they all could. In other respects, the whole went off very quietly, for the old folks could not bear noise and merriment. But old Dame Snail made a brilliant speech. Father Snail could not speak. He was much too affected. And so he gave them as a dowry and inheritance the whole forest of burdocks and said what they had always said, that it was the best in the world. And if they lived honestly and decently and increased and multiplied, they and their children would once in the course of time come to the manor house, be boiled black and laid on silver dishes. After this speech was made, the old ones crept into their shelves and never came more out. They slept. The young couple governed in the forest and had a numerous progeny, but they were never boiled and never came on the silver dishes. So from this, they concluded that the manor house had, had fallen to ruins and that all the men in the world were extinct. And as no one contradicted them, so of course it was so. And the rain beat on the dock leaves to make drum music for their sake, and the sun shone in order to give the burdock forest a color for their sakes. And they were very happy, and the whole family was happy, for they indeed were so. End of The Happy Family by Hans Christian Andersen Read by Brian Brady The Old House by Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the street up there was an old, a very old house. It was almost 300 years old, for that might be known by reading the great beam on which the date of the year was carved, together with tulips and hope vines that were whole verses spelled as in former times, and over every window was a distorted face cut out in the beam. The one story stood forward and great way over the other, and directly under the eaves a leaden spout with a dragon's head. The rainwater should have run out of the mouth, but it ran out of the belly, for there was a hole in the spout. All the other houses in the street were so new and so neat, with large window panes and smooth walls, one could easily see that they would have nothing to do with the old house. They certainly thought. How long is that old decayed thing to stand there as a spectacle in the street? And then the protected windows stand so far out that no one can see from our windows what happens in that direction. The steps are as broad as those of a palace and as high as to a church tower. The iron railings look like just a door to an old family vault. And then they have brass tops. That's so stupid. On the other side of the street were also new and neat houses, and they thought just as the others did. But at the window opposite the old house, there sat a little boy with fresh rosy cheeks and bright beaming eyes. He certainly liked the old house best, and that both in sunshine and in moonshine. And when he looked across at the wall where the mortar had fallen out, he could sit and find out there was the strangest figures imaginable, exactly as the street had appeared before, with steps, projecting windows, and pointed gables. He could see soldiers with halyards, 
and spouts where the water ran, like dragons and serpents. That was a house to look at. And there lived an old man who wore plush breeches, and he had a coat with large brass buttons and a wig that one could see was a real wig. Every morning there came an old fellow to him who put his rooms in order and went on errands. Otherwise, the old man in the plus breeches was quite alone in the old house. Now and then he came to the window and looked out, and the little boy nodded at him, and the old man nodded again. And so they became acquaintances, and then they were friends, although they had never spoken to each other. But that made no difference. The little boy heard his parents say, The old man opposite is very well off, but he is so very, very lonely. The Sunday following, the little boy took something and wrapped it up in a piece of paper, went downstairs and stood in the doorway. And when the man who went on errands came to pass, he said to him, I say, master, will you give this to the old man over there away from me? I have two pewter soldiers. This is one of them, and he shall have it, for I know he is so very, very lonely. And the old errand man looked quite pleased, nodded, and took the pewter soldier over to the old house. Afterwards, there came a message. It was to ask if the little boy himself had not to wish to come over and pay a visit. And so he got permission of his parents and then went over to the old house. And the brass balls and the iron railings shone much brighter than ever. One would have thought they were polished on account of the visit. And it was as if the carved out trumpeteers, for there were trumpeteers who stood in the tulips carved out on the door, Blue with all their might, their cheeks appeared so much rounder than before. Yes, they blew. Tratatera, the little boy comes, Tratatera, and when then the door opened. The whole passage was hung with portraits of knights in armor and ladies in silken gowns, and the armor rattled and the silken gowns rustled. And then there was a flight of stairs, which went a good way upwards and a little way downwards, and then one came on a balcony, which was in a very dilapidated state. Sure enough, with large holes and long crevices, but grass grew there and leaves out of them all together. For the whole balcony outside the yard, the walls were overgrown with so much green stuff that it looked like the garden. But it was only a balcony. Here stood old flower pots with faces and asses' ears, and the flowers grew just as they liked. One of the pots was quite overrun on all sides with pinks, that is to say, with the green part, shoot stood out by shoot, and it was quite distinctly, the air has cherished me, the sun has kissed me, and promised me a little flower on Sunday, a little flower on Sunday. And then they entered a chamber where the walls were covered with hog's leather and printed with gold flowers. The gilding decays, but hog's leather stays, said the walls. And there stood easy chairs with such high backs and so carved out with arms on both sides. Sit down, sit down, said they. Ugh, how I creak. Now I shall certainly get the gout, like the old clothes press. Ugh. And then the little boy came into the room where the projecting windows were and where the old man sat. I thank you for the pewter soldier, my little friend, said the old man, and I thank you because you come over to me. Thank ye, thank ye, or cranky, cranky, sounded from all the furniture. There was so much of it that each article stood in the other's way to get a look at the little boy. In the middle of the wall hung a picture representing a beautiful lady, so young, so glad, but dressed quite as in former times, with clothes that stood quite stiff and with powder in her hair. She neither said thank ye, thank ye, nor cranky, cranky, but looked with her mild eyes at the little boy, who directly asked the old man, where did you get her? Yonder at the broker's, said the old man where there are so many pictures hanging, no one knows or cares about them, for they are all of them buried. But I knew her in bygone days, and now she has been dead and gone these fifty years. Under the picture in the gazed frame, there hung a bouquet of withered flowers. They were almost fifty years old. They looked so very old. The pendulum of the great clock went to and fro, and the hands turned, and everything in the room became still older but they did not observe it. They say at home, said the little boy, that you are so very, very lonely. Oh, said he, the old thoughts with that, 
What might they bring with them? Come and visit me, and now you also come. I am very well off. Then he took a book with pictures in it down from the shelf. There were whole long processions and pageants with the strangest characters, which no one ever sees nowadays, soldiers like the knave of clubs and citizens with waving flags. The tailors had theirs with a pair of shears held by two lions and the shoemakers theirs without boots, but with an eagle that had two heads, for the shoemakers must have everything so that they can say, it is a pair. Yes, that was a picture book. The old man now went down into the room to fetch preserves, apples, and nuts. Yes, it was delightful over there in the old house. I cannot bear it any longer, said the pewter soldier who sat on the drawers. It is so lonely and melancholy here. But when one has been in a family circle, one cannot accustom himself to this life. I cannot bear it any longer. The whole day is so long, and the evenings are still longer. Here it is not all what it is over the way at your home, where your father and mother spoke so pleasantly, and where you and all your sweet children made such a delightful noise. Nay, how lonely the old man is. Do you think that he gets kisses? Do you think he gets mild eyes or a Christmas tree? He will get nothing but a grave. I can bear it no longer. You must not let it grieve you so much, said the little boy. I find it so very delightful here. And then all of the old thoughts, with what they may bring with them, they come and visit there. Yes, it's all very well, but I see nothing of them, and I don't know them, said the pewter soldier. I cannot bear it. But you must, said the little boy. Then in came the old man with the most pleased and happy face, the most delicious preserves, apples, and nuts. And so the little boy thought no more about the pewter soldier. The little boy returned home happy and pleased, and weeks and days passed by, and nods were made to the old house, and from the old house, and then the little boy went over there again. The carved trumpeteers blew. trot a terra There is the little boy. trot a terra and the swords and armor on the knight's portraits rattled, and the silk gowns rustled, the hog's leather spoke, and the old chairs had the gout in their legs and rheumatism in their backs. Ugh! It was exactly like the first time, for over there one day and an hour was just like another. I cannot bear it, said the pewter soldier. I have shed pewter cheers. It's too melancholy. Rather let me go to the wars and lose arms and legs. It would at least be a change. I cannot bear it any longer. Now I know what it is to have visit from one of old's thoughts with what they might bring to them. I have had a visit from mine, and you may be sure it is not so pleasant a thing in the end. I was at least about to jump down from the drawers. I saw you all over there at home so distinctly, as if you were really here. It was again that Sunday morning. All you children stood before the table and sung your psalms, as you do every morning. You stood devoutly with folded hands of father and mother, were just as pious. And then the door was opened, and little sister Mary, who is not two years old yet, and who always dances when she hears music or singing, of whatever kind it may be, was put into the room. Though she ought not to have been there, and then she began to dance, but could not keep time, because the tones were so long. And there she stood, first on the one leg, and then bent her head forwards, and then on the other leg, and bent her head forwards. But all would not do. You stood very seriously altogether, although it was difficult enough, but I laughed to myself, and then I fell off the table and got a bump, which I have still, for it was right, not right of me to laugh. But the whole now passes before me again in thought, and everything that I have lived to see, and these are the old thoughts with what they bring to them. Tell me if you still sing on Sundays. Tell me something about little Mary, or how my comrade, the other pewter soldier, lives. Yes, he is happy enough, that's sure. I cannot bear it any longer. You have given him away as a present, said the little boy. You must remain. Can you not understand that? The old man now came with a drawer in which there was much to be seen, both tin boxes and balsam boxes, old cards so large and so gilded, 
such as one never sees them now, and several drawers were opened, and the piano was opened. It had landscapes on the inside of the lid, and it was so hoarse that the old man played on it, and then he hummed a song. Yes, she could sing that, he said, and nodded to the portrait, which he had bought at the broker's, and the old man's eyes shone bright. I will go to the wars, I will go to the wars, shouted the pewter soldier as loud as he could, and threw himself off the drawers right down on the floor. What became of him, the old man sought, and the little boy sought. He was away, and he stayed away. I shall find him, said the old man, but he never found him. The floor was too open. The pewter soldier had fallen through a crevice, and there he lay as in an open tomb. That day passed, and the little boy went home, and that week passed, and several weeks too. The windows were quite frozen. The little boy was obliged to sit and breathe on them to get a peephole over to the old house, and there the snow had been blown into all the carved wood and inscriptions. It lay quite up over the steps, just as if there was no one at home, nor was there any one at home. The old man was dead. In the evening, there was a hearse seen before the door, and he was borne into it in his coffin. He was now to go out into the country to lie in his grave. He was driven out there, but no one followed. All his friends were dead, and the little boy kissed his hand to the coffin as it was driven away. Some days afterwards, there was an auction at the old house, and the little boy saw from his window how they carried the old knights and the old ladies away, the flower pots with the long ears, the old chairs, and the old clothes presses. Something came here and something came there. The portrait of her who had been found at the broker's came into the broker's again, and there it hung, for no one knew her more. No one cared about the old picture. In the spring, they pulled the house down, for as people said, it was a ruin. One could see from the street right into the room where the hog's leather hanging which was slashed and torn, and the green grass and leaves about the balcony hung quite wild above the falling beams, and then it was put to rights. That was a relief, said the neighboring houses. A fine house was built there with large windows and smooth white walls, but before it, where the old house had in fact stood, was a little garden laid out, and a wild grapevine ran up the wall of the neighboring house. Before the garden, there was a large iron railing with an iron door. It looked quite splendid, and people stood still and peeped in, and the sparrows hung by scores in the vine and chattered away at each other as well as they could, but it was not about the old house, for they could not remember it. So many years had passed, so many that the little boy had grown up to a whole man, yes, a clever man, and a pleasure to his parents, and he had just been married and together with his little wife, had come to live in the house here, where the garden was. And he stood by her there whilst she planted a field flower that she had found so pretty. She planted it in her little hand, and pressed the earth around it with her fingers. Oh, what was that? She had stuck herself. There sat something pointed, straight out of the soft mound. It was, yes, guess, it was the pewter soldier. He that was lost up at the old man's house and had tumbled out and turned about amongst the timber and the rubbish and had at last laid for many years in the ground. The young wife wiped the dirt off the soldier, first with a green leaf and then with her fine handkerchief. It was such a delightful smell that it was to the pewter soldier just as if he had wakened from a trance. Let me see him, said the young man. He laughed and then shook his head. Nay, it cannot be he, but he reminds me of a story about a pewter soldier which I had when I was a little boy. Then he told his wife about the old house and the old man, and about the pewter soldier that he sent over to him because he was so very, very lonely. And he told it as correctly as it had really been so that the tears came into the eyes of his young wife on account of the old house and the old man. It may possibly be, however, that this is the same pewter soldier, said she. I will take care of it and remember all that you have told me, but you must show me the old man's grave. 
but I do not know it, said he, and no one knows it. All his friends were dead. No one took care of it, and I was then a little boy. How very, very lonely he must have been, said she. Very, very lonely, said the pewter soldier, but it is delightful not to be forgotten. Delightful, shouted one something close by, but no one except the pewter soldier saw that it was a piece of the hog's leather hangings that all had lost all its gilding. It looked like a piece of wet clay, but it had an opinion, and it gave it. The gilding decays, but hog's leather stays. This the pewter soldier did not believe. End of The Old House by Hans Christian Andersen Read by Brian Brady The White Snake from Grimm's Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Max Holloway A long time ago, there lived a king who was famed for his wisdom throughout all the land. Nothing was hidden from him things was brought to him through the air. But he had a strange custom. Every day after dinner, when the table was cleared, no one else was present, a trusty servant had to bring him one more dish. It was covered, and even the servant did not know what was in it. Neither did anyone know, for the king never took the cover off to eat of it until he was quite alone. This had gone on for a long time, when one day the servant, who was carrying away the dish, was overcome with such curiosity that he could not help carrying the dish into his room. When he had carefully locked the door, he lifted up the cover and saw a white snake lying on the dish. But when he saw it, he could not deny himself the pleasure of tasting it. So he cut off a little bit and put it in his mouth. No sooner had it touched his tongue than he heard a strange whispering of little voices outside his window. He went and listened, and then noticed that it was the sparrows who were chattering together and telling one another of all kinds of things which they had seen in the fields and the woods. Eating the snake had given him the power to understand the language of animals. Now, it so happened that on this very day the queen lost her most beautiful ring, and the suspicion of having stolen it fell upon this trusty servant, who was allowed to go everywhere. The king ordered the man to be brought before him, and threatened with angry words that unless he could, before the morrow, point out the thief, he himself would be looked upon as the guilty and should be executed. In vain, he declared his innocence. He was dismissed with no better answer. In his trouble and fear, he went down to the courtyard and took thought how to help himself out of his trouble. Now some ducks were sitting together quietly by the brook and taking their rest, and whist they were making their feathers smooth with their bills. They were having a confidential conversation. The servant stood by and listened. They were telling one another of all the practices where they had been waiting about all morning and what good food they had found. And one has said in a pitiful tone, something lies heavy in my stomach. As I was eating in haste, I swallowed a ring which laid under the queen's window. The servant at once seized her by the neck, carried her to the kitchen and said to the cook, here is a fine duck, pray kill her. Yes, said the cook, and weighed her in his hand. She spared no trouble to fatten herself and has been waiting long enough to be roasted. 
So he cut off her head. As she was being dressed for the spit, the queen's ring was found inside her. The servant could now easily prove his innocence. The king, to make amends for the wrong, allowed him to ask a favor and promised him the best place in the court. The servant refused everything and asked only for a horse and some money for traveling, as he had a mind to go see the world and go about a little. When his request was granted, he set out on his way. One day he came to a pond, where he saw three fishes caught in the reeds and gasping for water. Now thought it is said that fishes are dumb. He heard them laminating that they must perish so miserably. As he had a kind heart, he got off his horse and put the three prisoners back into the water. They quivered with delight, put out their heads and cried to him, We will remember you and repay you for saving us. He rode on, and after a while it seemed to him that he heard a voice in the sand at his feet. He listened and heard a king ant complain, Why cannot folk with their clumsy beasts keep off our bodies? That stupid horse with his heavy hooves has been treading down my people without mercy. So he turned on a side path, and the ant king cried out to him, we will remember you. One good turn deserves another. The path led him into a wood. And there he saw two ravens standing by their nest and throwing out their young ones. Out with you, you idle good-for-nothing creatures, cried they. We cannot find food for you any longer. You are big enough and can provide for yourselves. But the poor young ravens laid upon the ground, flapping their wings and crying, Oh, what a helpless chicks we are. We must shift for ourselves, and yet we cannot fly. What can we do but lie here and starve? So the good young fellow alight and killed his horse with his sword and gave it to them for food. They came hopping up to it, satisfied their hunger, and cried, We will remember you. One good turn deserves another. And now he had to use his own two legs. And when he walked a long way, he came to a large city. There was a great noise and the crowd in the streets, and a man rode up on horseback, crying out loud, The king's daughter wants a husband. But whoever sues for her hand must perform a hard task. If he does not succeed, he will forfeit his life. Many had already made the attempt, but in vain. Nevertheless, the youth saw the king's daughter, and he was so overcome by her great beauty that he forgot all danger, went before the king and declared himself a suitor. So he was led out to the sea, and a gold ring was cast into it. Then the king ordered him to fetch this ring up from the bottom of the sea, and added, If you come up without it, you will be thrown in again and again until you perish amid the waves. All the people grieved for the handsome youth. Then they went away, leaving him alone by the sea. He stood on the shore and considered what he should do, when suddenly he saw three fishes come swimming toward him. They were the very fishes whose lives he had saved. The one in the middle held a mussel in his mouth, which it laid on the shore with its young feet. When he had taken it up and opened it, there laid a gold ring in the shell. Full of joy, he took it to the king and expected that he would grant him what he had promised. But when the proud princess perceived that he was not her equal in birth, she scorned him and required him first to perform another task. 
She went down to the garden and strew with her own hands ten sacksfuls of millet in the grass. Then she said, Tomorrow morning before the sunrise, these must be picked up, and not a single grain be wanting. The youth sat down in the garden and considered how he might perform this task, but he could think of nothing. And there he sat sorrowful, awaiting the break of day, when he should be led to death. But as soon as the first rays of the sun shone into the garden, he saw all ten sacks standing side by side, quite full, and not a single grain was missing. The king ant had come into the night with thousands and thousands of ants, and the grateful creature had, by great industry, picked up all the millet seed and gathered them into sacks. Presently, the king's daughter herself came down into the garden and was amazed to see that the young man had done the task she had given him. But she could not yet conquer her proud heart and said, although he has performed both the task, he shall not be my husband until he has brought me an apple from the tree of life. The youth did not know where the tree of life stood. But he set out and would have gone on forever as long as his legs would carry him, though he had no hope of finding it. After he had wandered through the three kingdoms, he came one evening to a wood and lay down under a tree to sleep. But he heard a rustling in the branches and a golden apple fell into his hand. At the same time, three ravens flew down to him perched themselves upon his knee and said, We are the three young ravens whom you saved from starving. When we had grown big and heard that you were seeking the golden apple, we flew over the sea to the end of the world where the tree of life stands and have brought you the apple. The youth full of joy set out homeward and took the golden apple to the king's beautiful daughter, who had now no more excuses left to make. They cut the apple of life, and the two ate it together, and then her heart became full of love for him. And they lived to a great age in undisturbed happiness. The White Snake from Grimm's Fairy Tales Recorded by Max Holloway.